Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video I'm going to be continuing my short looks at different aspects of Upfront and moving on with some of the questions I've received uh, from, from some of my viewers. Um, there, have, there have been a lot that have focused around the different kinds of armoured vehicle, armoured fighting vehicles that you get in this game. Um, what it's like using them, uh, how how they behave really, because some of the rules for them are quite quite different to um, as of necessity uh, in a in a card game that's mainly about infantry combat. So over the next couple of videos, I'm going to be looking purely at armored vehicles and certain aspects of how they operate within Upfront. In today's video, I'm just going to give a brief overview of the broad types of armoured vehicle that you get, uh, why they're different from each other, and just hopefully give you some idea of what their strengths and weaknesses are, and also how complex or not they might be to use within the game. Now, when we use the phrase armoured fighting vehicle, we usually think of at, at the weakest an armoured car and at the strongest a heavy tank and everything between. But in upfront, armoured fighting vehicle is defined as anything that actually has a slightly bigger card than an infantry unit. So picking on the Soviets as an example today, there's an infantry card, good old Sergeant Rostov. And so any card that's larger than that is an armoured fighting vehicle. So leaving Rostov aside, I've just laid out four such vehicles from the Soviet force mix. There are, of course, many more, but you'll see why I've chosen these, because they illustrate different types. So I'm going to begin with the weakest, and in some sense the easiest. This is a Lend-Lease M5 half-track in Soviet service. And you see what I mean? Although it's counted as an armoured fighting vehicle, it takes, takes some imagination to consider this as armoured. Um, but anyway, now... This one is quite straightforward. Armoured fighting vehicles share certain traits that are common to all of them. They have a um, bog check rating, um, which is, it, as, it's, as the name implies, is the likelihood that they'll get bogged down in difficult terrain. So the number to the left is the standard terrain bog check. The one to the right is if they're in wire. So that increases their difficulties in terms of trying to get out of that state. That The OVR is their overrun rating for when they're close assaulting infantry. All armoured vehicles have a crew exposed rating, so they have their two sides. If you start on that side, your crew exposed, hatches open, your commander's got his head out, or in the case of an open-topped armoured fighting vehicle, you're fairly exposed anyway. Um, as with infantry, their primary weapons have uh, malfunction values. And people who are familiar with how infantry work in fr up front will recognise this instantly. Range and firepower. Exactly the same rules as infantry, except this is, of course, much more powerful because it's a heavy machine gun. Uh, much of the rest of it, morale and the points value, is the same. And in some of my previous videos, I've given a glimpse of how armor works in terms of front armor and flank armor. Now you're probably wondering what the um, red highlighted I is. I is immobilized, S is stunned, and K is killed. So these are the different thresholds um, which an ordnance or, or boxed attack rating, it's not shown on this because it's only got a machine gun, um, needs to secure in order to either destroy stun or immobilize a vehicle. Now in the cases where you get a red shaded I, a comma, and then an S, if that threshold is reached by the attack, you draw a random number check, and if the color is red, then it's an immobilized result. If it's black, then it's stunned. So, this is a fairly straightforward vehicle. Effectively, like a, a call, call it almost a wheeled infantryman, it's also what's called an open topped vehicle. And you can tell because if you flip the card, most armoured fighting vehicles have a buttoned up side where they can still function on their reverse side, but their statistics are somewhat reduced. 
This half track, if it's flipped, is pinned, as you can see from what's on the card. And so like a pinned infantryman, it would have to be rallied. And if, because for game purposes, a crew of three is assumed, you need a rally three card to flip it back to its active side. Now, in some of the later videos, I'm going to look in more detail about how these different vehicles fight and how they are attacked. And I'll be looking a bit into how armoured uh, fighting vehicles that are open-topped are, of course, somewhat more vulnerable than their enclosed uh, counterparts. But for now, suffice to say, it's easy to recognise an open-topped armoured fighting vehicle. Just flip the card over, and if it has a pinned rather than a buttoned-up side, it's an open-topped AFV. Most tanks in the game, whether they're heavier armoured cars, light tanks, or even heavy tanks, usually have a mix of weaponry. So you see, in addition to the machine gun force points at different ranges, you have a range of ordnance to hit numbers. And in a couple of my videos, I have demonstrated armoured vehicles firing their ordnance, but I've not really treated them in any great detail. It's been more of a um, folding it into the larger narrative. So in the next video, I will be looking in more detail at how ordnance works as opposed to machine guns and lighter weapons. But just to point out the features, that's the range of random number draws that you need to score a hit on your opponent at the different ranges. You'll notice that because it's got an ordnance weapon, it has two effect numbers. The unboxed effect number is effectively the high explosive one, the one you'd use against infantry. And the boxed one is the armor penetration one. So one and one, the BA-6 is a fairly weak gun. All the other statistics on the cards and the way they function are exactly the same. And here, as you can see, on its reverse side, the vehicle is not pinned when it's flipped, it's buttoned up. Now, a player can voluntarily button up a vehicle, or, as a result of taking hits while it's in a crew exposed state and possibly losing, uh, uh, suffering a commander killed result, um, that can force a vehicle to be buttoned up. Now, once you button up, that's it for the scenario. The level of danger has compelled your crew to close the hatches and proceed much more cautiously. And so, as you can see, the to hit ratings have become a bit worse. The machine gun ratings have not really been affected because they tend to fire from the same position with the same limited point of view anyway. So that's a fairly interesting representative of a standard armoured car. I, I find things like this a bit more interesting because ev everyone shows a T-34 when we talk about the Soviet Union, so I thought I'd opt for something a bit different. But that's not the end of the variety. Here we have the T-26S, which is a flamethrower version. And again, there's a level of complexity here because exactly mirroring how infantry flamethrowers work, you have to get to relative range 5 to use that thing's boxed firepower of 14. And you'll notice that because of that special weapon, having the flamethrower, the overrun value of this tank is vastly greater than those of many of the others. And that's because coming right up to an infantry position and spraying it with fire, nine times out of ten you're generally going to clear them out. And what makes this tank truly terrifying is that it can use its flamethrower with only a slight decrease in effectiveness when it's buttoned up. It's very vulnerable to other armour. You wouldn't want to use this in a tank battle but as an infantry support weapon tearing its way into a heavily defended um, sector, this is a nasty piece of work. As you can see, the standard rules for flamethrowers apply. No defensive terrain effects modifier. Okay, it doesn't gain a flanking fire bonus, but with that amount of firepower, to be honest, it really doesn't need it. And its moving fire is not halved. 
This is a fairly unusual, you don't see very many of these, but very deadly weapon, and you get interesting variants of these in each of the armies represented in Upfront. Now the last type in the stable, these are not universal to every army, they're, they're more common to the ones that were desperate enough to need to employ them. And this is the self-propelled gun. Now how do you tell these fellows apart? <clears throat> Well, one way is the illustration. Very often you will be able to tell from the hull-mounted weapon. But just to make things absolutely clear, if the unit type is underlined, that's a self-propelled gun. And self-propelled guns have some strengths, but they also have significant weaknesses. Because the, the lack of a turret is a serious handicap. So... The two-hit number range is all right, but most significantly, these fellows cannot fire while they're moving. So their weaponry is usually powerful, but it's offset by that lack of mobility. One thing to note, a armoured vehicle which is bogged down can generally fire with only a minor inconvenience to its to-hit ability. These fellows, when they're bogged down, suffer a minus two level to their to hit capability. Uh, as you can see, like I said earlier, no moving fire is allowed. And they also suffer significant penalties when they try to hit moving targets. So it's not really that great for them. And buttoned up, it's very, very hard to actually, uh, to actually try and get anything out of them. Um, oh yes, there we go. Yeah, so massive penalty if they're bogged down or immobilized. Hard to hit a moving target. And of course, if that's a cumulative effect, it does render this unit very ineffective. They also are the polar opposite of this thing. Now, this is fairly useful, the half-track and creatures like it, when you're in an infantry support situation and you're going up against infantry. That additional firepower and mobility is great. Not so good if you're one of these facing a lot of infantry, because as you'll have noticed, there is only the heavy gun. There is no machine gun of any description to defend this thing against infantry. And while it has a formidable high explosive rating, it's again hampered by the difficulties of trying to hit anything, especially if it's infantry on the move. So, very powerful units, um, self-propelled guns, but they do have their shortcomings. And those, very briefly, are the four main types, subcategories, if you will, of armoured vehicles that you'll encounter in this game. Uh, as I say, in the next video, I'm going to be looking a bit more closely about how ordnance works, because although I have touched on it in some of my playthroughs, um, I have been asked if I can go through it again in um, more step-by-step -step detail and also talk a bit more about the various modifiers that ordnance weapons um, have applied to them, because it's not... It, as, as with some of the more um, complicated upfront rules, there's a long list to be aware of. And it's another area where I'd recommend having a cheat sheet. But I'll get on to those in the next video. In the meantime, I hope this has been uh, interesting and I hope it's helped you understand the differences between the various types of armoured vehicle just a bit more. Um, if you want me to do similar ones, uh, analyses of other nations' armoured fighting vehicles, please do let me know and I'll happily do them. But I think the Soviets for now are as good as an example as any. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. As always, if you're my regulars, a very warm welcome to you. Always good to have you on board. And if you're new to this channel... A very warm welcome too. Thanks very much and I hope that I'll be seeing you again. And as always, thank you all for the pleasure of your company. Bye.